Tonight's illuminating conversation is creating global solutions through science education, featuring Larry Brilliant and Janet Napolitano in conversation with Milton Chen of the George Lucas Educational Foundation. Before we begin, we would like just to take a moment to thank PG&E, tonight's presenting sponsor, as well as Franklin Templeton Investments and Carmel Partners, who have sponsored this evening's event. <laughs> tonight's conversation will last about 40 minutes. And at the end of the program, uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, again, using those cards uh, that uh, you should have received just now as we've all settled into our seats. And if you pass those, we'll announce an opportunity to pass those to the end of the aisle and collect those uh, to be posed uh, to the entire audience. And then at the very end of the program, uh, we'll ask that you exit either at the top of the theater or down here on the right-hand side at the bottom of the theater. If you have any difficulty navigating the stairs, uh, please remain seated. One of our staff members will be along to assist you. And we'll also have plenty of people on hand to help with any empty glasses uh, to ensure a <laughs> safe exit uh, from the theater. So with those things in mind, we lastly want to take a moment to thank all of you uh, for your sponsorship of the Academy that allows us to further our mission to explore, explain, and sustain life. Thank you for joining us this evening. And, <laughs> and please join me in welcoming our esteemed speakers, Larry Brilliant, Janet Napolitano, and Milton Chen. <laughs> well, what a pleasure it is to share the stage with President Napolitano and Dr. Brilliant, two luminaries here in California who will illuminate our conversation today. Um, their bios are in your program, and I won't say a lot about them, but of course you know. Uh, President Napolitano was our Secretary of Homeland Security as well as Governor of Arizona. Uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant, of course, is doing a lot of things, but uh, is involved with the Skoll Fund, is involved with filmmaking through participant media in Jeff Skoll's work. Um, also was the head of Google.org. So um, lots to talk about, and I thought we'd start first by just having you tell us, by way of introducing yourselves, just a minute or two on what's occupying your minds these days. Janet? <laughs> a few things, yes, uh, if I might say. But uh, uh, I think where this audience is concerned, there's so much going on at the university now uh, uh, in research on some of the world's grand challenges. Uh, we have a 10 campus wide uh, initiative underway looking at the issue of food and food insecurity around the planet. How do you set the world on a pathway to a secure, sustainable food future? And obviously, a very important part of that is climate, and a part of climate is water. So we have a lot of work underway uh, on, on the drought and water, and how does California sustain itself uh, during uh, this period of acute drought? Um, another uh, uh, project we have underway is to make the university as a system carbon neutral by the year 2025. Uh, this is huge. I mean, yeah. yeah. Hello. I applaud that. Um, and what it's about is it's it's how we, um, uh, what we build, the materials we use, the footprints of the buildings that we have, the different types of technologies and sensors that we are using in our classrooms, in our dormitories, in our laboratories, in the hospitals. Uh, which we uh, which we run throughout the state of, of California. And in so doing, by adopting that as a goal for uh, the entire system, uh, we're really uh, helping to, I think, generate a lot of good science and a lot of good practice uh, along the way, and maybe some that others, uh, others in the state of California will take away. Great. Larry? Uh, well, with my colleagues that are here in the audience from Skoll Global Threats Fund, uh, I've been working on uh, some of those bad things that we fear could bring humanity to its knees. Uh, climate, water, pandemics, regional conflicts like in the Middle East, nuclear weapons. And uh, as any parent, you can't choose amongst your children. Uh, so they're all equally important to me. But what I've been personally involved in in the last uh, year is Ebola. Uh, sometimes something comes 
so much that it pulls you away from all the other things that you plan to do. And that's certainly been Ebola for me. And I, I'll just tell you one anecdote, because there are now 15 committees uh, for the G7, for the Institute of Medicine, for the White House, for the UN, WHO, trying to figure out what we can learn from the things we did right and the things that we did wrong to prevent us from the next possible pandemic. And I was at a meeting for the G7 in uh, Berlin, and we were discussing this. And that day, there was an article in the local newspaper saying that a doctor in, in Germany had issued a 100,000 euro challenge because he did not believe that measles was a virus. He didn't believe that the vaccine worked. And he was skeptical that anybody had ever proved that. So he uh, offered this 100,000 euros. And then when people came in with proof, he said, no, no, I, don't, I just don't believe it. I don't accept it. And there was no standard for what is proof, even I though he lived I don't believe he had 100,000 euros. He, <laughs> well, you're, you, you know, you could be right about that, except the court ordered him to pay it. He then appealed to the higher court. And my argument is he'll then appear to the, appeal to the highest court of all, which is the court of public opinion. And unless we train people in science at great universities like yours, that jury that will be the ultimate jury in the court of public opinion will not really be able to help us very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Our topic today is, is creating global solutions through science education. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you to uh, tell us a story from your own career, your own life uh, about facing global solutions through science education. Well, I think um, uh, uh, a story I, I recall is shortly after I became the Secretary of Homeland Security, and Homeland Security involves so many different things. It's, uh, it is uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. It's cybersecurity. Uh, it's uh, the TSA, and before you say anything, I invented pre-check, so... Thank you. <laughs> you. For, uh, for all, from all of us, thank you very much, Janet. Um, but a whole host of things. But one of the most important components of DHS is that we actually have an Office of Health Affairs. And the Office of Health Affairs is, is designed to uh, help the United States deal with a situation when you are in potential pandemic. Um, and uh, shortly after I became uh, secretary, uh, all of a sudden erupts H1N1, uh, the new flu. Uh, and when it erupted, uh, no one quite knew what kind of flu was it going to be. Was it going to be uh, one that was fairly benign as flus go or one that would ravage uh, the United States and the globe a la 1918? Um, and uh, one of the, the funniest things I remember is we were scurrying around uh, assembling a plan how we deal with H1N1 uh, working with Health and Human Services, which didn't have a confirmed secretary then, uh, uh, really getting our feet in our shoes, so to speak. And uh, we kept hearing references to a, a history of the 1918 pandemic, a book called 1918, uh, <laughs> uh, by a guy named John Barry. And so uh, I stopped by a bookstore on, on the way home. I thought, well, I'll pick up a copy. And, it was, and they said, well, we're all sold out. Apparently, everybody in the administration was running uh, to figure <laughs> out you know, about the flu. We became uh, as expert as you could possibly be within the time frame we had uh, available. I'm sure you were working on some issues in involving, uh, involving flu. But even when you're dealing with flu, you are now looking into issues of pandemic and public health. And uh, when you look at health systems uh, planning throughout the United States, you recognize the fragility of the health care system we have when you confront a true situation of possible pandemic uh, and all of the cascading impacts that occur, including basic questions. Do you shut the public schools? Um, do you... Um, uh, do you shut the borders? Do you close the airports um, with the huge economic impacts uh, that, that, that that would have? So lots of big issues had to be confronted very, very quickly. Larry? Well, I'll, I'll follow up on that. I mean, the H1N1 uh, frightened people so much because it's precisely the same virus that did cause the pandemic of 1918 and did kill between 25 million and, uh, and 100 million. And uh, we didn't know whether we would get lucky or unlucky at roulette 
the roulette wheel of the genomic shift and drift and reassortment That's right. could have gone to b make a disease that either spread quickly and killed a lot, spread quickly and didn't kill very many at all. And in the case of H1N1, we got really lucky, and it spread tremendously quickly. It was probably the most transmitted viral disease in human history. Somewhere between one and two billion people contracted the disease in less than one year. Mm -hmm. But because it didn't kill very many, thank God, only about 300,000, <laughs> and I say only because every year the a annual influenza pandemic kills 400,000. So there was a reaction against the uh, way in which the media and scientists warned people about it, and people said, well, you know, this was, you know, you overreacted to it. And um, Jeff Skoll, who I work with, he said, we can't allow people to forget what a real pandemic looks like, and he said, let's make a film that really tells people the real science, the, the best science we can, and that led us to make the film Contagion. That's right. So we could get Kate Winslet to tell you the truth because you'd never believe it from a scientist. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it worked. It worked. Uh, Contagion was seen by almost 600 million people, and we've been told that the Tea Party, which was saying cut, 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 with no exceptions, the budget, cut, 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 with no exceptions. Uh, we did a showing of Contagion for a Tea Party rally, and afterwards they said, well, you're not going to change our mind. It's still cut, 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 with no exceptions, except the pandemic budget. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> they were going to have Kate Winslet play me, right? <laughs> she did play you. <laughs> no, no, she played you. She did play you. <laughs> the trick is going to be the other way around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to laugh when you're talking pandemic, but we can get you there. <laughs> so when it comes to global solutions, um, what are you particularly excited about that's going on, especially the role of universities and schools in doing the science education for this next generation to prepare us to face some of these global solutions. What are some of the issues that you're most optimistic about? Well, I'll let you go first on this one. Uh, well, let's go into something that's not controversial at all, like um, uh, forcibly vaccinating children before they can go to school. <laughs> 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 um, you know, the Senate, uh, um, uh, the committee voted, was it seven to two or yeah, nine to two? Yeah, they passed it out yesterday, I think. To, yeah. to, bring, to bring it out on Wednesday. Um, you, you know, there are a lot of issues. Uh, I, I think the most important thing in dealing with something like this is to have real compassion for the people who disagree with you. Because if you push hard enough, you'll see that they often have really good reasons for a position that you just don't agree with at all. Um, I know parents of autistic kids, and I know how hard and um, gut-wrenching it is to be in a community of children with autism and you always want to find a reason for it y you know you're, you're mad at science you're mad at government you're mad at God y you're just trying to find some reason for it and when a bad scientist Wakefield does bad science in an otherwise good journal Lancet and publishes a piece of science which is a lie and fraud and is done deliberately to make money and that sticks even after it's been retracted and everybody says it's not true. There is no link between autism and, and vaccination. There's no link at all. But once it's in the public meme, it is so hard to extract it. It's much harder to take that idea out of the public imagination than it is to put one in. And I'm really excited and happy <coughs> that that conversation is taking place. I'm, I'm desperately sad for people for whom this is such a gut-wrenching decision. For a pure scientist, it's not a hard decision at all. You can't let children who are immunocompromised, who have poor immune systems, lose the right to go to school because other children, based on choice, are not being vaccinated. Are, are not being vaccinated. It's, 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 we, we know the science and we know the public policy. That doesn't solve the problem. That just begins the conversation. So. Lesson number one, listen to the folks on the other side with an open heart and with compassion. Even though you think it's an easy issue, it's a tough issue, and I, I think we're getting to the right decision, but we've got to do it slowly and not run over people. Yeah, I think... Um, yeah. 
You know, uh, when science gets into the realm of uh, the media, um, we have to have uh, consumers of the media who have some basic understanding of science. Uh, and that begins at a very early age. Um, and uh, ex exposure to things like w what happens here at the academy, uh, curriculum in the schools, uh, it should be uh, more and more rigorous as uh, students go through school. Uh, and then the opportunity to attend uh, a great public uh, university. Um, and uh, even while they may be majoring in something totally different, uh, being uh, uh, required to take some coursework uh, that facilitates uh, scientific literacy uh, and a certain amount of comfort with complicated scientific concepts and precepts. Because the, the era that we are in and the things that are happening in this era um, are driven so much by science. Uh, right now we're seeing such tremendous progress uh, in the biosciences. Uh, medicine is being revolutionized almost overnight in some areas, uh, but also in uh, the science associated with climate, climate study, well, okay, let's take climate to move away from pandemic for a moment. Um, and uh, uh, really until I, I think an inconvenient truth got into the public sphere, uh, no one um, in the general public really thought much about climate and what was causing climate uh, changes in the climate and what role uh, we had uh, to play in that. And of course now there's a much broader understanding, but there's a huge uh, political debate that's going on. Uh, and the consumers of that debate, i.e. voters, uh, need to be equipped on, on how to discern who has the better side of the argument and to make those evaluations. Uh, they can listen with open ears, uh, they can watch with open eyes, but in the end, people need to make judgments about uh, who they think has the better side because uh, there are a lot of things that happen as a result of that conclusion. And, and I'll, if I could, I'll make a plug for my friend Jeff Skoll, who also uh, was the creator of, of that movie with Al Gore. Um, and Which we I did not know before this, by the way. Uh, so yes, she did. Yes, she did. No, yes, she did. And we've got it's all organized. <laughs> but it, I, I think that as we talk about early education, uh, I grew up with the, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, the three R's, and I I sort of believe we have to add a fourth, and it has to be reading, writing, arithmetic, and risk, because we're not quantitative enough. Uh, it's not just in our competition with countries around the world to be competitive economically where we're falling down in STEM education. It's not only in dealing with modernity and the complexities of modernity. It's not only even in dealing with bioterrorism and cyberterrorism and the new forms of warfare that are so incomprehensible without a scientific background. But it's, it's our, our life. If we're talking about pandemics, uh, and, and I tell you that most of my peers believe that there's a 10% probability that there will be a pandemic that will kill a million people in 10 years. Well, is that a lot or a little? Do we take 10% probability, multiply it by a million deaths, divide it by 10 years, and say, this is what I have to divide my money to? I mean, how do we deal with climate change, which has a certain 100% probability affecting all of us if we live long enough and we don't know how long that is? How do we adjudicate between this. I, I'm reminded about uh, a saint. Uh, I lived in India for 10 years, so saint stories are easy. Uh, I'm reminded of a saint who was in Benares, which is a place where a lot of people in India go to die because it's a holy place. And he was walking down to the Ghats where there were burning bodies. And as he walked down, he encountered a one-legged man, a blind man, uh, a woman with leprosy, a woman whose child was near death because she didn't have the food to feed him. And he asked himself, how many coins do I have in my pocket? How do you allocate scarce resources and keep your heart open in hell? How do you make decisions like that from your heart and now with your head? If, if we don't have our heart open, we won't even see the choices in front of us. If we don't have an education that helps us understand risk and put it in consequences, we can't make public policy decisions. 
So the world's a big place. And uh, are there areas of the world, areas of the globe, that you are especially, again, excited about the work going on that you think are important for us to focus on? I know you're both involved with many things around the globe, but if you could point to one or two examples of global issues that you feel we're making some progress on. Um, well, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think uh, in the, the area of medicine uh, and the whole opening of the human genome and what that ultimately means for different types of treatments for diseases that previously had been considered incurable. Uh, I, I think there's tremendous work going on. And what's, what's exciting about it is it is uh, being done in so many different places. A lot of it being done right here in California, uh, a lot of it being done at NIH, you know, at the National Institutes of Health, uh, the co uh, and other countries around the globe. But we are really now making huge advances um, in medical treatments that we didn't have before. And uh, now we see um, movement to, they call it precision medicine. I've heard different labels, uh, but really taking uh, medicine to be almost custom designed uh, for you, uh, for how your particular disease uh, presents uh, and what your particular biologic makeup is uh, so they can go in and target exactly uh, where the uh, disease is being fomented uh, without uh, perhaps destroying uh, other cells or healthy tissue or what have you. You know, there was a great um, series on TV uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Cancer, it was called, uh, was on PBS. Mm -hmm. It was a Ken Burns documentary, Three Nights. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, what it showed is what's happened in the last century, um, we, uh, and particularly uh, what's happened since uh, Nixon was president and declared the so-called war on cancer. Uh, there are certain childhood leukemias now that basically have a 95% cure rate, and they were fatal. Uh, not that long ago. We're seeing progress like that being made in cancer after cancer and other types of diseases uh, as well. And then the different types of bio, biomedical, bioengineering that's going on uh, uh, from very uh, s straightforward devices like an insulin pump, so you're not uh, constantly pricking your finger, uh, to much more sophisticated devices. And this is revolutionizing the way uh, we think about healthcare, healthcare treatment. Now we need to tackle the issues about access and affordability uh, uh, because the science is getting there, I'm afraid, faster than the access and affordability issues are. Larry, parts well, of the globe I, for? I, I, re I really like what yeah. you said in, in, in every way. Um, I think there's three things that make me optimistic. There's probably a lot longer list, but uh, first, when I was at Google, I learned a lot about scale. And I believe that the scale of coming down the cost curve of photovoltaics, of solar energy, is breathtaking. Mm -hmm. w when, when we were trying to predict uh, at, at Google what was the most important thing to do in climate, we came up with a formula which is uh, RE less than C. The cost of renewable energy had to be less than coal, whether we raised the cost of coal with taxes or surcharges or we lowered the cost of renewable energy. And we, we anticipated with the best we had, this is 10 years ago, we were looking at six, seven dollars per kilowatt hour for photovoltaic energy. We're now under a dollar, maybe 85 cents. That's a market clearing price once you have a level playing field. And that, that's exciting as hell because policy or uh, political beliefs will not stand in the way of a juggernaut of a cost curve like that. In the field of pandemics, um, the, the most important thing is early detection and rapid and effective response. Mm -hmm. If you have early detection, it, it's important to have a vaccine, an antiviral, a point of care diagnostic, but you won't have it on day one. And uh, 20 years ago, it took us six months to find every new virus that jumped from an animal that could cause a pandemic. You give a virus a six-month head start, especially one that replicates every three or four days, and causes four new vi viral diseases. You'll have a billion diseases. You're giving the virus a billion head start. We're now down to 21 days, six months to 21 days. If we can get down to one or two incubation periods, seven days, we will not have pandemics. And, and, and we will be able to end pandemics in our lifetime. 
And that makes me That's terribly great, exciting. That would be terrific. And the third one is not about technology. It's about the people here in this room who support the California Academy of Sciences, who support all the amazing things that happen in San Francisco. And I'm not just pandering, although there's probably a little bit of that, but I'm not a fundraiser. <laughs> um, you, you know, we take a lot of flack, and we should, between the increasing disparity between the rich and the poor. But there's something different about our rich. I mean, I like to tell my friends who live in uh, New York and other countries, our billionaires are different than their billionaires. I it is almost a cost of entry now that when you are successful in a high-tech company, you're looking at Mark Benioff's 111 model, 1% 1 of your equity and 1% of your product and 1% of your staff will be used for philanthropic purposes. Or you're looking at a way to include in your portfolio of things something you believe about, like Lorene Jobs' commitment to education and immigration. In fact, I would be hard-pressed to mention any of our titans without mentioning some really good thing that they are passionately committed to, including almost a billion dollars raised from this community to fight against Ebola. That's more than governments put in. So this level of generosity it, it, it's not an antidote for the problems of access and the problems of, of disparity of income, but it sure as hell is a good beginning. And, you know, a lot of the people in this room, I know, we all know the good works that you do. And th while I said that's th the third thing that makes me optimistic, it's far and away the thing that makes me the most optimistic. Great. <laughs> so when it comes to the science education piece of this. Now, we've talked about it starting earlier. We've talked about the importance of the University of California, the role that it plays. Uh, are there, again, some success stories, some things that you see on the horizon that you find very exciting? It's great that Sal Khan is also at the same time talking about the work that Khan Academy has done. Uh, I'm sure there are many examples that you see and otherwise that you'd like to point to that are really providing that scientific literacy, that risk literacy earlier for, for students. Well, like I said, um, all of our, you know, uh, the, the students that come to the University of California, they're good students. I mean, it's tough to get into the University of California. Uh, but we're still pushing science and, and general education requirements uh, beyond that of the specific major. More and more uh, go into the STEM fields. This is, uh, uh, you know, the, these are our most popular majors now for obvious reasons in a state like California. Uh, in particular, uh, but what's great about that and what we're seeing uh, now is uh, greater diversity amongst the students who are coming out of the university with degrees in the STEM disciplines, with degrees in formerly, you know, kind of, uh, if I might say, white male bastions like computer science, uh, now much, much more uh, diverse. And when I look at our graduate schools, uh, our medical schools, um, our, our engineering schools and the like, a much, much greater uh, diversity in those student populations. And I think that's great. Why? Because uh, um, California is, an, is a majority minority state uh, and, will be, uh, and will be so for the future. And it's important that um, all the disciplines re um, have that uh, reflected and th those opportunities are open. Uh, I think one of the, the things that I get really excited about is the fact that you can take a university like the University of California where 42 percent of the students are first generation, neither parent went to college, where 40 plus percent are from families uh, that um, earn less than fifty thousand dollars a year, 55 percent less than eighty thousand, but but forty some odd percent from low income and a big chunk of those from below $25,000 a year. And those uh, students, they enter the University of California, they graduate, they get their degrees, they go on to grad school, they go to professional school. Uh, they're ready, and they're ready really to take over for the next generation, as the next generation of Californians. That is a mobility that no other state really can reflect at the numbers that we do it uh, in California. And uh, it does require the participation uh, of the public to support uh, an institution like that, but it will make a terrific amount of difference for all of us as we move forward. 
I'd like to remind you, we will be taking a few questions towards the end, so if you have a few questions, just pass them to your right, and we'll, we'll collect those. Larry, STEM education, things that you're excited well, about? Well, first of all, I'm really glad that Governor Napolitano and Secretary Napolitano is now President Napolitano <laughs> <laughs> of the University of California and a public school, um, which is actually the second best public school in the country, <laughs> next to the University of Michigan that I went to. <laughs> <laughs> You can <laughs> see there are a couple of Wolverines. A few, a few people have bought it. They were planted not, not in the yeah, audience. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we're, we're a very aggressive animal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I'm a, I'm a first generation uh, to go to college. I'm the first person uh, in my family um, uh, to graduate from high school. I'm not the first person in my family to graduate from the University of Michigan because I never graduated. My daughter, who's here in the room, did graduate from the University of Michigan, <laughs> as she reminds me. But but I, I have to tell you, all kidding aside, I'm very worried uh, about education in the United States. Uh, I don't know those of you who read uh, uh, Christoph's column this morning in the Wall in the New York Times, and he said, in a way, we've lost so many of the battles on fighting for uh, educational quality, educational access. Uh, maybe we should just start earlier, uh, pre-K because the other battles are too contentious. I, I don't agree with that. I don't think we've lost. But that he would write something like that is indicative of how much despair there is in the field. It, it seems to me it should be the most self-evident thing of everything that we do. We believe in democracy. We believe in the rule of the people. In order for the people to rule us intelligently, they must be well-trained. In this more complex world, they must be well-trained in STEM, as well as in civics and political science and geography and geology. We still live in a country where there are four states where 80% of the people living in those states do not own a passport, have never left the country. That's true for their congressmen, by the way, that were elected. If we are not a better educated community, no matter how wealthy we are today, we will not be wealthy tomorrow. So, so I'm worried. And, and that brings us to the California Academy of Sciences. Because this, I, I was in the hall with John Foley, who I've known for quite some time. We're so lucky to have him here. Uh, the, the people in Minnesota are crying every day that they've lost him, <laughs> uh, another great public school. Um, but, you know, he, he was saying that uh, the only group of uh, institutions that are still well respected by the population in the country are museums. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, I think he's probably telling the truth. But if that's the case, let's take that political capital and let's start spending it. Let's use our museums for more public education and bring the great debates into the hallways extended hallways of museums and use the credibility that we have in a science museum to make sure that the great questions do not remain unanswered and undebated. And that's maybe the thing that could come out of this that would make me the most optimistic because we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed. Uh, I think we're getting a few questions, but as we move to that, you mentioned water. Water is an issue that has come to us in California, of course, but it's a global issue. And what sorts of, again, solutions do you see, both for us here in California, that also could be applied to the rest of the world? Well, different, uh, for sure, uh, the development of uh, different types of technologies where water is concerned, uh, but also uh, uh, looking at agriculture uh, and how things are planted, where they're planted, uh, architecture, how we design buildings, how we landscape buildings, uh, public works, public transportation. Uh, University of California uh, has been, there are scientists there that have been working on drought resistant uh, crops, uh, and some of which are used in the third world uh, now uh, uh, to help deal with uh, issues of drought and hunger. They are related. Uh, so uh, all kinds of issues relating to how we manage our water, uh, how we design in an era where you have to look at 
water as a finite resource, not an infinite resource, uh, and then uh, moving beyond um, how we make sure that uh, we are sharing the things that we've learned, not just within the state, but throughout the country and the, and the globe. I, I want to comment on the global part of that because uh, the Himalayas are melting. Uh, the, the water that is coming down from the Himalayas is in inequitably uh, uh, divided between India and Pakistan and China, predominantly Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal as well. And uh, China uh, just geologically controls the ice. India controls the dams. And that means that Pakistan cannot control the food for its own people. It is a hostage to decisions made by India, as is Bangladesh. And rumors get spread and acrimony develops. And these are three nuclear-armed countries. And it's not a good idea to have three nuclear-armed countries who have fought four wars in the last 50 years to be contentious over issues of food and, and water. So we've been working on um, creating a Himalayan council. Uh, President Olafur Ragnar Grimson of Iceland, who's an amazing statesman and a great world leader, did something like this when he helped to create the Arctic Council to shepherd the world through the period of time when the sea ice would melt during the summer. And countries, both neighboring countries and distant countries, wanted to fight over the rights for exploration and, and transportation. He got the idea of doing the same thing in the Himalayas. And I was at that meeting, several of us here in this room were at that meeting in Bhutan about three months ago. And it's really amazing that you can get the he former, a lot of formers, former heads of state, former uh, heads of the military from India, Pakistan, and China all talking together about how to work so that there are not rumors and misunderstandings. And then to kind of catch themselves and say, you know, We've never had this conversation before. So the more we can look for creative new ways of governance, of conversation, to use uh, the opportunity to reduce the chance that water becomes a causes belli, I think that's one of the things we need to think about when we think about water. I think that's right. In fact, uh, when uh, you look geopolitically around the globe at some of the hot spots, uh, you will find underlying the hot spot a major water issue. Uh, and, a, and a water rights issue, access to water issue. You see it in the Middle East, uh, India, Pakistan, for sure. That's a big part of it. So a couple of questions, uh, perhaps, about the dark side of scientific advancement, technological advancement. How can the Bay Area technology and philanthropic communities help prepare for these potential downsides, pandemics, AI risk, geoengineering, uh, bioterrorism? I'm going to let you take that first because <laughs> I have so much to say there, but you go ahead. <laughs> you, you know, one of the things that makes me sleep better at night is the things that you know that you don't have to talk about right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> um, at TED uh, a few weeks ago in Vancouver, uh, Bill Gates uh, did some pretty interesting and um, I think amazing things. First, he, he rented an entire uh, auditorium and converted it into an Ebola treatment room where everyone at TED had an opportunity to to put on those spacesuits and see if they could figure out how to take them off and not get infected. And he did a couple of op-eds at the same time. And we talked a lot um, about uh, the role of technology in trying to solve problems like that. And I, I, I think that one of the things that came out is that we are dealing in a world where it is n no longer a requirement that you be a state actor to build an instrument that could create a, a level of havoc we've never seen before. Um, I'm reading a, a book right now called I Am Pilgrim, which I'd never heard of, and it's a badly written book. But it has exactly what I know to be the scientifically correct blueprint and how to make an instrument of bioterror that could kill 100 million people. And it's a pulp read. And for $1,500 and a high school bench science and a couple of what we used to call model planes and we now call drones, um, the world has turned to a place where the offensive, asymmetric, a an asymmetrical war, everything favors the offense. Now we have to figure out 
how to use our companies, our great minds, our entrepreneurs, our great institutions, and we got to play defense, and we got to be tough, and we got to be tough-minded. And the thing that came out of TED is Bill said, for a long time we've been playing war games to try to anticipate what our enemy would be doing. From now on, I think we have to be playing germ games. Mm. You know, um, uh, there's there's some there's uh, there there is a lot to that. Uh, part of it is uh, kind of thinking about better ways we use science uh, to protect ourselves. So, uh, right now, for example, there are some scientists at uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, and they have uh, developed uh, something. It's an ink, and you you put it on with a, a pen, uh, but it it allows you to do all different kinds of uh, sensing uh, to see whether somebody's been exposed to, and you can kind of program it the way you want to program it. Uh, they started um, uh, off looking at uh, botulism, but uh, looking at other now toxins as well. Uh, that would be cheap, inexpensive, that uh, you could b provide more uh, uh, generically through uh, not just the public safety population, but but others. I mean, those kind of ideas, it, uh, it's time for us to have them to help keep us safe. We also, however, need to be talking about risk, and it goes back to something you said at the beginning of our discussion. We do not live in a risk-free environment. We, we never have, and we certainly don't today, and we, and we never will. So we have to be able to, uh, you can't stop living because there's risk. Uh, we have to work uh, uh, in a lot of different types of ways to mitigate risk, to keep it as low as we can, uh, to be able to respond as effectively and quickly as we can when something does materialize. Uh, but uh, to recognize that we, we are also strong enough to Get back up and get back on our feet and get and 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 get back to doing uh, what we do. Y some countries of the world, because of uh, the tragedy of circumstance, have learned to do this. Israel being, I think, a, a primary example. Um, United States, we really have not. Yeah. United States is still a zero tolerance for risk uh, uh, society uh, country. Um, and we are working our way, and, and sadly enough, we will have to work our way through that. And I think one of the things our political leadership needs to do is to help set that table better. Well, this conversation has been illuminating, but it's also um, feels like it's just been going, it's just getting started. Uh, we do stand between you and dinner, so we'll bring it to a close. Please help me in thanking our two guests. Larry Brilliant and Janet Napolitano. <laughs>